Aloha. This is the State of the State of Hawaii show. And I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Our topic today is the historic nomination of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court of the US, uh, referred to often as SCOTUS. Our guest is here to discuss the promise of the nominee, Judge Jackson, um, and her, she is Dr. Sue Klein, who works in Washington, D.C. on equity and um, gender issues. Um, she is the um, e Education Equity Director for the Feminist Majority Foundation. So, Sue, welcome for bringing your expertise to Think Tech Hawaii for this discussion about the U.S. Uh, judicial or portion of the U.S. judicial system. Thank you. I'm delighted to join you, Stephanie. So good to see you and appreciate your time very much. Um, tell us, Sue, can you please um, speak about your work with the Feminist Majority Foundation and how, how you promote and disseminate information about critical equity issues for women and others? Sure. Uh, I uh, worked. Uh, uh, in the U.S. Department of Education for about 36 years. And when I retired, I joined the Feminist Majority Foundation in around 2003 or four, and uh, as their education direct, uh, equity director and have stayed there ever since. One of my first major accomplishments was developing the handbook for achieving gender equity through education. It was the second edition of the handbook that we put out and we reviewed the research in all kinds of areas about sex equity or gender equity as it's generally called now. And uh, what I've done uh, at the Feminist Majority Foundation is education advocacy work primarily related to uh, implementing Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. Uh, Title IX, as many of your listeners probably know, prohibits sex discrimination in education programs and activities that receive federal financial assistance. Some of, some of the work that is done is to support the government and the officials in the government on these issues of gender and uh, equity. Did you say that it's commonly referred to now as equity or, or gender issues? Um, often gender issues instead of sex issues. <laughs> and, and so, okay, so you're, so the, the, um, the, the, can you talk to us about then how, um, your organization and your work uh, combines with um, your other role as co-president, right? As with the Clearinghouse on Women's Issues. Right, the Clearinghouse on Women's Issues is an old organization, uh, about 40 some years old. And it uh, talks and uh, helps um, interested people that started out pretty much in the DC area but now with the pandemic, we've gone to Zoom. And so we have um, uh, clearinghouse members all over the US and participants in our meetings from all over the world. So um, we've in a sense benefited from the Zoom meetings uh, to expand our coverage on uh, gender equity issues in all areas, including uh, the area of uh, laws and legislation um, and uh, minority uh, women's rights and things like that. Okay, and I think I heard you also mention that Title IX isn't a big portion of, of your portfolio, right? That the, um, the law on, on Title IX issues that uh, prohibit gender discrimination in education and um, is that that's a big portion of the portfolio, isn't it? Especially of my portfolio is at the Feminist Majority Foundation, where I'm the Education Equity Director. Okay. Well, um, then 
you recently had one of those Zooms, which uh, was uh, uh, that that focused on the the nominee for SCOTUS, right? So um, can you talk a little bit about um, what the meaningfulness of that clearinghouse was as far as its timing and then also what, what it's about? On March 22nd, we had our monthly meeting for to celebrate women's history on the US judiciary and the role of the women in the US judiciary. We selected this topic way back last summer before we know, knew that we would have a major event and celebration of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson's uh, nomination uh, to the Supreme Court and Justice um, Breyer's retirement. But we knew even then that the Supreme Court was going to play a major role in women's rights issues as you all know, it does so in the reproductive rights area. And we're uh, very much afraid that with the unbalance in the court now, uh, there's going to be bad decisions about uh, the abortion rights. Well, with, with uh, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson um, being the nominee, did, do, did the discussion in that that presentation and in, in your work there um, indicate what influence she especially brings to her role in on the court, given that it's a conservatively dominated court. But what what's the view on her her impact potentially? Well, we we don't know too much about the specifics of her views on things like reproductive rights, and even the Equal Rights Amendment. But um, we do know that she is very highly qualified. And the reason we had the clearinghouse meeting was because there are other things that uh, need to be improved with the courts, various kinds of court reform with the Judiciary Act. Uh, as you know, uh, things like uh, uh, increasing the numbers of the Supreme Court members to four and uh, changing uh, their terms from lifetime terms to 18 years or so have uh, been proposed. So we, we wanted even last summer to try to learn more about what do we do to protect women's rights in particular and minority rights and everyone's rights in general um, uh, by making improvements in the Supreme Court. And we wanted our feminist community to be aware of these issues. So Sue, that's that's interesting um, uh, that uh, your agenda is uh, a powerful one and um, can make a big difference. But how do you all decide on the agenda. Do you poll your community? Um, your, I mean, your, the name of your group is the Feminist Majority. So, how do you um, actually scan and monitor for input from the community, or um, what's the network? Um, that who are the stakeholders there that have some voice in making up the agenda for your organization? We welcome uh, suggestions from our members, but actually, most of the work is done by the Clearinghouse Board of Directors. We have vice presidents that have expertise in various areas. We have a former official from the U.S. Department of Education, Office for Civil Rights. We have an expert in uh, international uh, gender equity issues. Uh, we have um, uh, experts in management, all kinds of things, so that uh, we and they're all feminists, so we uh, combine our insights to um, pick topics and encourage others to suggest topics of interest. Well, I, I, I believe you have Senator Hirono in your network of stakeholders, yes? Can you tell us about why she's involved with your organization? Um, 
Senator Hirono is fantastic. And I've mainly worked with Senator Hirono as she was the chief developer and sponsor of the Gender Equity Education Act um, that um, we now have in Congress, um, uh, waiting for more sponsors, by the way. And I thought we would uh, discuss that more at the end of the meeting. But the other thing, uh, getting back to the main topic of this meeting on uh, 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 J Judge Jackson's nomination to the Supreme Court is we're very delighted that Senator Hirono is on the Judiciary Committee. Oh, that's right. So our, our Hawaii senator um, is very active <laughs> these years, I mean, especially in legislating, because this is uh, uh, recently she's done other bills and um, uh, having to do with hate and like that. But anyway, so, yes. Yeah, so tell us about what that means to you all and in your communication. Oh, that what that means is that um, we were able to watch her uh, deliver her testimony on uh, Judge Jackson. And from what I watched of her testimony, what she did was an excellent job of uh, counteracting many of the Republican senators who went before her comments where they were trying to um, bring uh, Judge Jackson down and attack her in various ways. Serona, Senator Hirono came in with uh, the evidence to show how they were wrong. So uh, that what was, was a for those who didn't see that here. It's, can you can you tell any more details about what she had to present to show how misguided were their comments? I don't remember exactly what uh, she said, but one of the comments uh, that's gotten a lot of press attention as your listeners probably know, is uh, they've criticized Judge uh, Jackson for her decisions uh, being light on sentencing uh, people for possessing uh, pornography, child pornography. Um, and what um, the evidence shows is that uh, uh, Judge Jackson sentences within the norm of what other judges do. And she had very good reasons, particularly for a case that was brought up in that area. Um, one of the advantages for living in Washington, perhaps um, you didn't see this in your Hawaii papers, is um, the Washington Post even interviewed uh, the person that was the subject of this case that was sentenced by Judge Jackson to what the Republican said was too light a sentence. Uh, and um, one of the things that this young man said was he was at that time thought that it was too heavy a sentence because of course he had to go to jail for a certain amount of time. Uh, but uh, now so he was he, so he thought it wasn't a what he thought his sentence was too light. Or what um what what did you say he thought about the yeah, sentence? That it was too uh too heavy. He was only seventeen when he committed the crime um, because he was gay. So um, that was another reason uh, where um, Judge Jackson showed her compassion and fairness and not ripping this young man's life with a very long jail sentence. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Her education credentials are far higher than most other judges in the Supreme Court. She went to an Ivy League law school. She's done Supreme Court clerking. She's and then um, her judicial uh, qualifications, she went to Harvard for education, um, which is, as everybody knows, hard to get into and to succeed in. But her judicial qualifications are as high as her education qualifications. She um, 
did Supreme Court clerking. She's been a public defender. That was a point uh, that came out in a lot of the testimony. She, of course, served uh, a great role in the Sentencing Commission. And she's also been a district judge and most recently was pointed to the DC Court of Appeals. Mm -hmm. So um, we're really grateful that um, she's even more qualified. This article points out a great uh, chart, um, lines her off and shows her qualifications compared to all of the other uh, Supreme Court justices. And she comes out higher than any. That's interesting. Um, thank you for, for sharing those specifics. Um, I, I haven't seen them elsewhere um, listed uh, so, so clearly like you did. So there's much to learn from this nomination process. And, and even though we have the other side saying things, as you said, trying to what you said was bring bring her down or show how she's not a match for for the work. Um, I you you your organization offers information on this to the your constituency, which is all women and more people than that. Because what what do we learn from this? What are you all also holding out as um, the the learning opportunity of this process and and that you're wanting to disseminate um, and encourage people to, to see it. What, what, what are those principles you're looking for us to learn? Well, I thought uh, listening to the testimony was a great way for people to learn about how Supreme Court justices work. Um, Judge Jackson was very clear in uh, discussing her methodology for judging and for writing up her, her opinions. Uh, for example, she said that she writes very detailed opinions that are very helpful that uh, describe the evidence at length and the laws that she's following to make her judgments about uh, compliance or non-compliance with the judicial principles. So that was very good. Another point that I learned uh, from listening to the hearings uh, was how she uh, makes decisions on things that didn't exist at the time the Constitution was written. For example, um, uh, she is uh, asked to make decisions about privacy related to cell phones. Okay, so you're now you're re, you're going back in the to the history of of the Constitution, right? Is that that where right. I'm so right. and, and what did she point out about that? Well, um, or what did you understand better about that? Yeah. One of the things that she pointed out, of course, was that Judge Scalia was an originalist who tried as much as possible to have the interpretations of the Constitution, the interpretations that the forefathers who wrote the Constitution would agree with. And Judge Jackson pointed out to my surprise that he has had a great influence on the court and that a lot of people stick with the originalist ideas when making their decisions. I didn't realize that. I would have thought that she would be more of a contextualist modernist uh, approach uh, whenever she could, but uh, she seemed to think that that was past precedent and didn't object to that. Well, is that the same position that Breyer, the justice that she's going to, re that she could replace if she's voted in? Is, is that the same position that he had or what was he more um, con uh, contemporary? I, I haven't seen that discussed, but that's a really good question, Stephanie. I don't know the answer. Well, um, what what about that? That is amazing, isn't it? That she turns out to be a, a proponent or a respectful of precedent. Pre respectful uh, of the precedent. Of oh, respectful of the precedent, and but not specifically an original list like Judge Scal Justice Scalia, right? 
but right. respectful. And, and so what does, how does that apply to so many of our issues now and that your organization, I think, is, is uh, very um, involved with, which is you know, abortion and um, the issues of schooling too. Does, uh, yeah, I, I mean, how does, how, how, how does that square with that? What, what is it likely she'll be able to bring to the court when it has to deal with those really huge issues of the Roe versus Way, Roe versus Way, yeah. I think you'll have to ask some of our lawyers uh, more to talk about those technicalities, but I'm hoping at least that her views of following court precedent will help with Roe v. Wade uh, decisions. Well, how do you think her views will? I mean, are you um, are you seeing her her strength as being influential? I mean, in the context that of a conservative court, is she going in there to um, to what to, 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 was that with the pet poncho and the uh, you know tilting at the windmills, <laughs> or do you think she can be? Uh, influential in the court, given its constitution right now? Well, I think she'll be influential, at least to the extent that Justice Breyer has been influential, but we need a lot more people uh, of her types of judicial fairness to be on the court along with her, um, because yeah. there's such an conservative uh, overbalance, shall we say, in the court now. Um, um, in the ways of finding out about your organization, have we been showing um, your URL or your, um, let's see, oh, there it is. Okay, so the feminist.org, they can get there. Is there um, also a, a URL. There we go. The clearinghouse. There we go. Thank you. And so people can go there to to find out what what is uh, the agenda currently and how their how how your organization is working to influence um, minds and thinking and laws and policy towards those agenda items. Um, as a matter of fact, in our April newsletter. The Clearinghouse on Women's Issues will give a link to the whole talk that we had at our meeting on uh, March 22nd. So you'll be able to do that. And also in our newsletter, we'll be preparing a summary of the highlights of that meeting. Uh, we'll also be announcing our next meetings. And your viewers are uh, welcome to attend our meetings. Uh, all they have to do to find out about the meetings and to sign up and register is go to our clearinghouse link that I believe you have, womensclearinghouse.org. Very good. Very good. Yes, that's very good. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about... Um, the position, uh, you've told us about the position of of your organization, but what what is being done to um, accommodate the uh, <laughs> the opposition? Are you having to um, fund a lot of a lot more uh, ways of trying to? I don't know if combat is the right word, but how how do you attempt to clarify uh, or override or you know dilute all of the, the vitriol and the other kinds of mis misinformation that's pouring out? Well, sometimes we confront it directly depending on what the meeting topic is, but we often plan our meetings to um, understand more about the problems that face women and, and men related to gender equity. Uh -huh. Um, and go into depth on legislation and other actions that people can help uh, to prevent inequities. Okay. Well, can you 
um, please, we're getting close to closing time. So if there's anything else you'd like to say about uh, your work uh, in the in your uh, organization, so people know uh, what 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 are the bit what's the bigger picture um, in DC for your your um, organization. In addition to the nomination of Judge Katani Brown Jackson, what are the other big issues you're really working hard on? Well, one of the things I've been working hard on is getting back to gender equity in education because this year, June 23rd, will be the 50th anniversary of Title IX. Wow. <laughs> prevented sex discrimination. And one of the areas of Title IX that I'm very interested in helping people learn about and let's do more about is the appointment of Title IX coordinators who have roles and responsibilities to implement Title IX in all of their education institutions. So, um, uh, for, and for Hawaii, you, this is another uh, um, place to to bump up that gen, the the Title IX um, coordinators' uh, role and outreach, right? Because did you say they're supposed to be out there even in the at the school level, trying to implement the provisions of Title IX? Right, and Hawaii has even been sued at various times for not doing their job as far as implementing Title IX. The whole State Department of Education was sued probably about 10 years ago for yeah. lack of implementation. But oh, interesting. <laughs> they can provide a lot more guidance and support Title IX coordinators. We hope to eventually have all uh, Title IX coordinators in all public schools. They don't have to be full time, but they have to be people who are interested and informed on enforcing Title IX and making sure that people know what their rights and responsibilities are to prevent sex discrimination. And this is increasing even as uh, we learned that Title IX covers LGBT students. Yeah, mm -hmm. really. Well. Very good. And, and, you know, we have had the Wahinis out there with it, the champions, you know, in, uh, in women's volleyball. So, I mean, we certainly do have some model, models of success and something to, to really build on. So it's been uh, very informative hearing um, about your work and, and that of your organization and uh, to have a little closer look at Judge Jackson's um, promise uh, offered to the Supreme Court if she if she is voted in and hopefully she will uh, and these in, gender issues for all um, can can become more of a reality and make a difference for everybody as they fulfill their potential and work uh, for democracy in this country so thank you so much Dr. Sue Klein for joining uh, Think Tech Hawaii on this program, the State of the State. Um, I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and we'll be back in two weeks and I look forward to seeing you then. Mahalo for your viewership and aloha everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.